Well, good evening. Good to see everyone here tonight, and welcome our visitors. We're glad you're with us. Uh, back at the beginning of May, I told you we were going to kind of have a theme of being a soldier as we went through uh, a lesson on standing firm, looked at the pieces of the armor, and then we looked at the good, what it means to be the good soldier, parts one and two. And this morning, I told you that I was calling this Centurion Sunday as we looked at Cornelius of the Italian cohort and the events surrounding his conversion. And that tonight, we'd be in Luke chapter 7, 1 to 10, looking at the centurion with so great a faith. This nameless centurion from Capernaum who caused Jesus to marvel at his faith. This is one of my favorite accounts as I read through the Gospels. It's found also in Matthew chapter 8 and here in Luke chapter 7. And I hope I've done it justice with the way I have put it together for you this evening. But as we talked about this morning about a centurion, the interesting thing about centurions is they were a Roman non-commissioned officer in the military today, we call that an NCO. <clears throat> they were a captain of at least a hundred men. They answered to a commander who were over a thousand men, so there'd be ten centurions reporting to one commander, and then that commander reported to a general who reported to Caesar. They were known, the, the centurions were, they were known for their brutality against those that they occupied. If you go back and look in secular writings about some of the things that centurions were notorious for, they, they, were the, they were the law. They acted as local law enforcement as well as soldiers in the battlefield. And as local law enforcement, if they didn't think your case warranted them looking at it, well, you might not ever get your case before a magistrate. They decided whether you were going to be heard or not. Most times, there are different situations that that could occur from, but they were known for their brutality against all those that they occupied. However, in the scriptures, we read of at least six centurions mentioned in the New Testament, and we don't see that type of behavior in any of these men, at least in the point in their lives in which it's recorded. In Luke 7, 1 to 10, you can also read this in Matthew 8, 5 to 13, there is the nameless centurion from Capernaum who asked Jesus to heal his servant. Then in Matthew 27, 54, also seen in Mark 15, 39, and the reason I say there possibly is seven is because of Mark 15, 44 through 45, mentions this, the only account in the Gospels where Joseph of Arimathea comes to get the body of Jesus from Pilate. And in Mark 15, 44 through 45, Pilate calls on the centurion, and it says the centurion, not a centurion, right after saying in verse 39 that the centurion standing at the foot of the cross heard Jesus' last breath and said, truly, this was the Son of God. In Luke chapter 23, verse 47, he says, Truly this man was innocent. So it's recorded two different ways for us in Matthew 27, 54, Mark 15, 39, and Luke 23, 47. But in Mark chapter 15, 44 through 45, Pilate is marveling at the fact that Jesus is already dead. He calls the centurion, verifies from him that Jesus is dead, and then the body is given to Joseph of Arimathea and those who came with him. So that's why I say there's at least six centurions. We don't know if it was a different centurion in Mark 15, 44 through 45 than what was mentioned in verse 39, but the way it's worded leads me to believe he called on the guy that was there and heard his last breath. And then in Acts 10 through 11, we talked about that this morning, Cornelius of the Italian cohort, also known as the first Gentile convert. In Acts 22, 25 to 26, there is also the centurion who reported to his commander, that means a man over 10 centurions, over a thousand men, he reported to his commander that Paul was a Roman that they had just ordered to be flogged. And Paul said, is it lawful for you to scourge a Roman citizen without cause? And then the centurion went running to the commander saying, hey, what are you about to do? So we read of that centurion in Acts 22. In Acts 24, 23, Felix put Paul in the custody of a centurion. And under the, the custody of that centurion, it says Paul was given freedom and his friends were able to come and go and visit him as they pleased. And in Acts 27, Julius of the Augustan cohort was the centurion whose custody Paul was put in, and he's the centurion that escorted him to Rome. Now, is he the same one from Acts 24? We don't know. In Acts 27, his name is given as Julius of the Augustan cohort, and you see that in Acts 27, verse 1, and he's the one that escorted Paul to Rome. All of these men seem to have some noble quality to them, especially when you look in Acts 22, 25 to 26, the centurion had orders to scourge Paul, and yet when he discovered he was a Roman citizen, he went to the commander and said, what are you about to do? He didn't say, well, orders are orders, <laughs> and go through with it. He was a man of in integrity and said, challenged his commander with, what have you done? 
What are you about to do? So all of these men seem to have some noble quality about them. So the scriptures actually have a lot to say regarding centurions. And in Luke chapter 7, 1 to 10, one of the nameless centurions stands out in particular, and we find that he was from Capernaum. And I want you to read with me in Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 1. And we'll read through verse 10 and then talk about it. <clears throat> it says, When he had completed all his discourse in the hearing of the people, he went to Capernaum. And a centurion slave who was highly regarded by him was sick and about to die. If you go to the Matthew 8 account, verses 5 through 13, you read that this, this slave, this servant, was paralyzed and fearfully <coughs> tormented. And so it says in verse 4, or in verse 3, when he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders asking him to come and save the life of his slave. When they came to Jesus, they earnestly implored him, saying, He is worthy for you to grant this to him, for he loves our nation. And it was he who built us our synagogue. Now Jesus started on his way with them. And when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself further, for I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. For this reason I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled at it, and turned and said to the crowd that was following him, I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. So this is the account we're going to be looking at this evening. The man that caused Jesus to marvel at him. He asked for the healing of a servant that he held in high regard who was at death's door. You know, it's often been said of, of every person that we every person is at least three people to other people around them. Uh, a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, it became very popular in, on social media to see memes or these posters coming out regarding certain professions. Do you know the ones I'm talking about? It would say some profession, fill in the blank, what my friends think I do, and there's some picture, what my family or my mother thinks I do, and there's some other picture, what I think I do, and some other picture, usually of them in some heroic stance, and what I really do, and something of them doing some mundane chore of whatever that profession is. There's been an old phrase that that has really come from that says every person is at least three people. What others, some phrases insert enemies, what others see you, how you see yourself, and how God sees you. One of the reasons I like this account in Luke chapter 7 is we get to see the centurion through the eyes of the Jews. We get to see the centurion through the eyes of himself, how he regarded himself. And we actually get to see this man through the eyes of the Lord. And so we get to see him through three different ways. And that's kind of how I've set this up for us to talk about it. So the first thing we're going to talk about is in Luke 7, 3 through 5, and what the Jews thought of him. Starting back in verse 1, it says, When he had completed all his discourse in the hearing of the people, he went to Capernaum, and a centurion slave who was highly regarded by him was sick and about to die. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders asking him to come and save the life of his slave. When they came to Jesus, they earnestly implored him, saying, He is worthy for you to grant this to him, for he loves our nation, and it was he who built us our synagogue. I want you to, to note some things just from this passage on face value. One is that the Jewish elders went on behalf of the centurion to see Jesus. That says a lot about this man, if you didn't know anything else about him. They quickly tell Jesus what they thought of the centurion. Based on common knowledge at the time, these Jews would have seen him as an occupier, representing a hated foreign power. When we read that Jesus called a tax collector to be by his side, and he called on a zealot, and the fact that these two men did not kill each other, or the zealot did not kill the tax collector, in the three years they served with Jesus, says a lot about the leadership that Jesus instilled in these men. The Jewish zealots were known as dagger men, and they were trained to be assassins. They were trained to kill and assassinate Roman officers. That's what the Jewish zealots thought of Roman soldiers, especially the officers, especially a centurion walking in the open would be an open target. Jewish zealots, there's a... a Hebrew word for them and a Greek word for them that meant dagger men. And I don't have those words. I'll suffice it to say they were dagger men, and that's all you need to know. They were assassins. Jesus called one of these men to be an apostle. So you know off the bat what he thought of Roman soldiers, what he thought of Roman officers. And so these dagger men 
were the ones who would bring about the Jewish revolt starting in AD 66 that would culminate with the death of millions in Jerusalem in 70 AD and about a thousand more at Masada, the fortress of Masada in 72 AD. Roman centurions were notorious for their brutality and roughness of character. This makes the Jewish elders' estimation of this man all the more unusual. Notice what they said of him when they came to Jesus in verses 4 through 5. They approved of him, for one. They said, he is worthy. The Jews cared for this centurion. They said, this, this man is worthy for you to come to his house and do this for him. The centurion cared for a slave. Verse 2 tells us he was a slave that he held in high regard, and this at a time when slaves were expendable. If one slave got sick and died, you moved on to the auction block and you got another. This was an unusual display of compassion. Most officials would not have shown such concern for a servant, hired or not, let alone a slave. And yet the Jews were able to tell Jesus he's worthy because he holds this slave in high regard. He's worthy for you to come and do this for him. They also said he loves our nation. This man was characterized by the Jewish elders as loving the nation of Israel. When you look at contemporary history of that time, this is not a characterization of a Roman officer, not commissioned or non, who came to Judea. They considered, they considered it the armpit of the Roman Empire. When they got sent to Judea, many Roman officers and legionnaires considered it a punishment. Why are we being sent to Judea? Why, what have we done that we deserve to go to Judea? And yet, this man, whether that was his cause when he first got there or not, he made these people his own. And he loved them. He cared for them. They were able to express to Jesus, these are the Jewish leaders who looked at Rome as occupiers. Probably the same ones who looked down on those who collected taxes for Rome. And yet they said, this man is worthy. Because he loves our nation. He's built us a synagogue. Perhaps this is where that love comes from. For this man. But this man put his love into practice. See, he didn't just tell the Jews he loved them. He showed them using his own resources, because you know Rome didn't do it, using his own resources, he built them a synagogue in this area of Capernaum. He loved not only in word, but also in deed. If you place a marker there in Luke 7, I want you to see this is the kind of love that John says that saints are to have for one another and for other people. Look in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 18. This is the kind of love that we are to show towards our brothers. In verse 18, all right, we'll back up to verse 16, talking about love. He says, we know love because of what Jesus did. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So he's talking right here in verse 16. Love is seen in action. Jesus loved us enough. He didn't just say, I love my creation. He said, I love you so much. The good shepherd will lay down his life for the sheep. We see that in John 10. So John is reminding us of that. Then he says in verse 17, how to put action into our love. He says, but whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Think of the correlation of what he's saying there. Jesus showed love through action. He says we're to show love through action. So he says it's not enough for us to see somebody in need, one of our brothers in need, and not do anything about it. He says, how does love, the love of God abide in us? Notice verse 18. Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. This man demonstrated his love for the nation of the Jews in this act of building them a synagogue. In Luke chapter 10, later on in this chapter that we're, that's serving as our text for this evening, later on in this chapter, Jesus is going to be asked a question by a lawyer. This is not a lawyer like we think, but an expert in the law of Moses. And he's going to ask Jesus, who is my neighbor? So Jesus is going to tell him a story about what has commonly been referred to as the Good Samaritan. And the bottom line in that story is that it was an enemy of the Jew. The Jew would have perceived him as an enemy. Because of his racial status, he was an, an enemy to the Jew. And yet he's the one that came to his rescue. The enemy came to the rescue and became a neighbor. Even so much so as taking this man who had been robbed, beaten with an image of his life taking him to an inn, putting him up, saying, I have to continue on the business, telling the innkeeper, here's extra money, and if his care requires any more than that, put it on my tab, I'll take care of it, 
when I come back through. So that that man who was being, who was beaten and robbed of everything that he had, would have no cost to himself. The Samaritan took it all on him and said, charge it to my account. This for a man that the Jews would shun so much so that if they had to go into Galilee, they walked around Samaria with the long way around rather than take the shortcut straight up through Samaria into Galilee. And yet it was a Samaritan who took the Jew in and showed him mercy. So when Jesus asked at the end of the story, out of these three, the Levite, the priest who walked on the opposite side of the street from this man, and then the Samaritan, he said, which one was the neighbor? Well, that expert of the law was kind of trapped, wasn't he? Remember his answer? The one who showed mercy. Remember Jesus' response after that? Go and do likewise. What he was saying is go and be a neighbor. This centurion, like the Samaritan in Jesus' story later on, was a neighbor to the Jews. He was, the Jews' estimation of him is that he was worthy. He loved their nation and he built their synagogue. He put his love into action on their behalf, and they saw it. You know, the question is, after we study something like this, is what would our neighbors, or as the phrase often says, your enemies, what would our neighbors or even our enemies say about us? And I can't, and just in case you think, well, because they're your enemies, they're going to just insert, fill in the blanks, and say whatever they want about you. Well, that might be true. I want you to think about Daniel. What were his enemies able to say about him? He prays to God three times a day. That was all they could come up with against him. He prays to his God three times a day. So that's where they put into practice in Daniel 6, how to get Daniel. But they looked in his business affairs. They looked in his personal affairs. And they found Daniel, just as God esteemed him, a man highly esteemed. And they could only get him in his affairs as far as it went, his spiritual life to God. What do others see in our life and what can they say about us? Would they say we are worthy? Would we say that we love God? Would they see that we love our brothers and we put it into action? In Philippians 2.15, we're to be lights in the world. In fact, in that passage, we also see that we are not only be lights in the world, but above reproach in the midst of a perverse and crooked generation. That perverse and crooked generation was there in the first century and it hasn't gone away. And yet, saints' charge is to be the lights in the darkness. We're also to be a good neighbor. As Jesus told the liar of the law in Luke 10, 30-37, we are to show mercy and be a neighbor. Would those around us consider us worthy of any type of blessing from God? Would they say, oh, they're worthy because of this, fill in the blank. And it doesn't matter what their motives might have been. They came to Jesus on behalf of the centurion saying he's worthy, he loves us, he even built us a synagogue. But then we get an interesting aspect of it. Jesus goes with them. And as he gets close to the centurion's home, the centurion sends another group of friends. And we get to see what the centurion thinks of himself in Luke 7, 6 to 8. <clears throat> it says, Now Jesus started on his way with them, and when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself further, for I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. For this reason I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you, but just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, with soldiers under me, and I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. <clears throat> Each of us has a view of ourselves, and it's either going to match what others around us think, or it's going to be far off. A Roman centurion is in command of a hundred men in a foreign land. And a Roman centurion in that position would have every reason to be arrogant, to think highly of himself, for what they command is love. <coughs> Throughout time we've known men in such positions of power that said, well, I'm the one in charge and so I'm going to do whatever I want to do and I'm going to treat you however I see fit because I can. You can see why secular history records that centurions and even those above them often acted with brutality to those they occupied. It would be easy for a man in such a position to have such arrogance, but we find a different attitude in this centurion. Through another group of friends, he tells Jesus what he thinks about himself. One, the first thing I want you to notice is his address to Jesus. Many times when the Jews came to Jesus, they referred to him as rabbi or teacher. And whether that was sarcastic or not, sometimes you get the feeling it was because 
they knew he was not trained in the special schools of learning that they were. He didn't sit at Gamaliel's feet, as the Apostle Paul. And so when they used the phrase rabbi or teacher, many times they were doing it because that's what the people expected. They didn't really feel that way because they were trying to test him and trap him. I want you to see what this guy said to Jesus when he first comes up, sends friends to him. He refers to him as Lord. Now, to the Romans, in a chain of command, he might refer to his commander as Lord. And the general as Lord, my Lord General, or even when they saw Caesar. But the word he uses here is not the word for Lord as a noble or one in charge or command. The word he uses here to address Jesus is the Greek word, Strong's 2962 in the Greek dictionary, kurios. That word, as we've talked about many times before, is the equivalent to the Hebrew word Yahweh, or where we get Jehovah, Y-H-W-H the special name of God to his people. Strong's 3068 in the Hebrew Dictionary. Kyrios means supreme Lord in reference to deity. When he sends friends to Jesus, he refers to him as Kyrios. He didn't just see Jesus as a great man and refer to him as Lord, as a deference as you would to a noble or someone in a charge or in authority. He refers to him as highest God, supreme Lord. The word the Jews did not want to hear associated with Jesus, and yet that's what this man knew about Jesus. He refers to him as curious. What I want you to see about that is from the very beginning, the rest of the words that follow show his deference, his submission to God. He refers to him knowing that no matter how many men he has under his command, he is inferior to this man who's been invited under his roof. And that's why he says, Lord, I am not worthy. Remember what the Jews said? What was the first thing they said to Jesus? He is worthy for you to come and do this for him. And then they give the physical reasons why. This man says, Lord, I am not worthy. This is his humble, sincere self-estimate. It is just the opposite of what the Jewish elders told Jesus. What we see in this man is an extreme attitude of humility. And from everything that we know in secular history about the Roman centurion, it makes this man all the more remarkable in that he refers to Jesus as curios. He doesn't call him one of the Roman gods. He doesn't refer to him as a noble, as we've already talked about. He refers to him as Yahweh. Possibly he alone, of all those concerned, knew, truly knew, just who was about to come under his roof. He refers to him as a term that the Jews just would not use. They, he referred to him as supreme Lord. He understood authority. He told Jesus that all Jesus had to say was the word, and his slave would be healed. He says, you don't have to take one more step. Say the word. Just as I can say to a slave, do this, and he does it, all you have to say is be healed, and he, I know my servant, my slave, will be healed. And we'll talk about that a little more later. But the application for us as we look at this account is a thorough self-examination is profitable to us all. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, examine yourselves. 1 Corinthians 11.28, in, in reference to the Lord's Supper, says, let a man examine himself. It's not something that, it's not a common meal that it doesn't matter what we've done during the day, what we appear like, what we do. We just come and we eat a common meal. It's different. It's something that we need to examine ourselves in the inward parts before we partake of that bread and the fruit of the vine because of what it represents. He says, let a man examine himself before we partake of such elements. And in 1 John 3, 19 to 20, I told you to turn there earlier and we read verses 16 to 18. Let's finish up that passage. In 1 John chapter 3, starting in verse 19, after telling us not to love with word or with tongue, but with deed and truth, he says, we will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our heart before him. And whatever our heart condemns us, for God is greater than our heart and knows all things. If our hearts condemn us, only you know your heart, you and God. No other mortal knows what's in your heart other than you tell it. 
And so those secret things, those things that only we know, we need to carefully examine our hearts and make sure our heart doesn't condemn us before God. But we need to have a sincere, humble self-estimation of our worth. But we also need to know our worth before God. There are some people that go, go to the extreme and say, I'm never worthy. And these individuals get so depressed, they end up taking their lives. No, Jesus thought you were so precious. He died for you. But we need to have the right type of self-examination that we see ourselves the way God sees us. So the question after we study the centurion is, are we humble? Do we have that humble heart? And are we humble enough to look at our lives in reference to the scriptures and see ourselves for how we truly are? And then make the corrections necessary if we come up lacking from where we ought to be. And not only do we see the centurion through the eyes of the Jews and himself, but then let's take a look at what Jesus knew about him in verse 9. In Luke 7, verse 9. It says, Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled at him and turned and said to the crowd that was following him, I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. Here Jesus is in awe at a man's faith. Jesus marveled at his faith and said he hadn't found such faith in all Israel. Do you realize that there's only one other instance where it's recorded that Jesus marveled? And that's in Mark chapter 6. But before we look at that, I want you to see what he says in the Matthew 8, 10 to 12 passage. In Matthew 8, 10 to 12, Jesus is saying, If Israel would not acknowledge her king, the despised pagans, the Gentiles, will. Notice what he prophesies here. I mentioned this part this morning when I said Jesus prophesied that the Gentiles would come into the kingdom. And we talked about that first Gentile convert, another Roman centurion, Cornelius, and in Acts chapter 10. Here in Matthew 8, 10 to 12, it says, Now when Jesus heard this, the same thing is recorded what Luke recorded. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who were following, Truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. I say to you that many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus here says, this guy gets him. This guy calls him Kyrios, Yahweh, God, Supreme Lord, and says, just say the word, my servant will be healed. Jesus says, I have not found such faith in all of Israel. And a day is coming when the pagans, the Gentiles, will recline with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. <coughs> and he says, but the sons of that kingdom will be cast out. And he says that later on in Matthew 21, 43. The kingdom has been removed from you and given to a people that will produce the fruit. And that culmination is seen in that in A.D. 70 with the destruction of Jerusalem. But it happened long before that with the death of Jesus on the cross. An institution of a new covenant in his blood, just as he said in Matthew 26 on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. If Israel would not acknowledge Jesus as her king, Jesus prophesied a time when the Gentiles would. You remember throughout the book of Acts, over and over as the Jews hounded Paul and Silas and Barnabas, wherever they went. And at one point, the Jews were kicking them out of the city, and Paul says, I, that's it, I'm done going to the Jews. I will go to the Gentiles. What was the response from the Gentiles in that city? Do you remember? They rejoiced that they could enter into the kingdom of God. The fulfillment of what Jesus said would happen after he witnessed such faith by a Roman centurion. There's only one other instance where it's recorded that Jesus marveled. Look with me in Mark chapter 6, 5 to 6. And this time, it's not at belief. It's not at faith. It's at unbelief. In Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 5. Here, backing up to verse 1, Jesus goes to his hometown. So he goes to Nazareth. And this is where it says in verse 3, they're saying, Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them in verse 4, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, and among his own relatives, and in his own household. And he could do no miracle there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he wondered, or marveled, at their unbelief. And he was going around the villages teaching. Here in Mark 6, 5-6, Jesus marveled 
but it was at unbelief, not belief. The only other time that it's recorded that Jesus marveled, he was in awe, was at this Roman centurion. This man's great faith is an indictment against the Jews and even Jesus' own disciples. Jesus said his apostles had little faith in Matthew 8, verse 26. We could also throw in specifically to Peter when Peter said, Lord, command me and I'll walk out on the water with you. And he says, come. And it says Peter went and then he saw the winds and the waves and he sank. And he cried out, Lord, save me. And as Jesus reached down to pull him out, he says, oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? And James warned, his disciples, warned the disciples of Jesus against having a dead faith. James 2, 17 and verse 26. This man's great faith is an indictment of Jesus' own people, his own apostles. And James warned the disciples at the time, and it's still relevant today, not to have a dead faith. The Roman centurion's faith was such that he knew all Jesus had to do was say the word, and it would be done. As we talked about, he was a man that understood authority. In order to have authority, you must understand authority. You must be able to submit to authority. A centurion was subject to a commander. That commander was subject to a general. And the general was subject to Caesar. In our modern day military, there is a chain of command. You will not get in a position of power and authority if you do not understand that chain of command. And if you do not abide by the rules of that chain of command, your leadership, just as it was given, can be taken. You, to be in authority, you must submit to authority. You must understand it and follow it. You cannot be given authority if you don't submit to authority. A commander gives an order. It's as good as done in that commander's mind because of the chain of command, which is the established rule of authority. This man understood all of that. And yet he understood Jesus had the supreme chain of command. He recognized him as the supreme Lord. That all he had to do was say the word and a servant would be healed. This wasn't anything any other man that he could have invited under his roof could do. And he knew it. He said, just say it. There's no show. You don't have to wave your hands. There's nothing that has to be done other than you speak it. And I know it will be done. 2 Timothy 2, 3 through 4, we spent two weeks looking at this passage and how it applies to us as being good soldiers of Christ Jesus. I could not help, as I read through this account, to think about this passage again. That as we talk about what it means to be a good soldier for Jesus, we need to recognize we are to submit to the one who is enlisted to us. That's what it means when he says, don't get entangled in the affairs of the world, but you please the one that enlisted you. We need to submit to Jesus. He is our commander-in-chief. We read in Ephesians 1, 22 to 23, Ephesians 5, 23, and Colossians 1, 18. He is the head of the church. And in fact, if you go back to Ephesians 1, 22 to 23, you see it says God put all things in subjection to him, which goes back to Matthew 28, 18 to 20. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Jesus is the supreme commander. He is the commander-in-chief. And as soldiers of Christ, we are to submit to him. And that's why we talked about that, of what it means to be a good soldier. We cannot say, well, this makes me happy, so we're going to do this. It doesn't matter if I can't find it in the scriptures. As long as it makes me happy, God wants me to be happy, we ought to do it. No, that's not understanding the chain of command. That's not understanding authority. We are the enlisted, he is the commander. And even this Roman centurion, understood that in his, as far as his role and his relationship to Jesus went. The centurion was so great a faith, was full of humility in that he considered himself unworthy to even see Jesus or have him at his home. And so we read in Luke 7, 10 and Matthew 8 and verse 13, Jesus did as he asked. When the servants went back to the house, they found that slave healed. What about your faith? Here's two questions that I have after reading this account about this Roman centurion, who is not even, as we read in Ephesians 2, who did not even have the, the, the common hope that Israel had. As a Gentile, he was without God, without hope. And yet he demonstrated such great faith, he caused Jesus to marvel at it. So here's the, here's the question about us. What about your faith? Would the Lord marvel at it? Would you cause Jesus to be in awe at the faith that you display? Or... Would he marvel at the lack of it? 
would he be so in awe because of all the people in the world you ought to display the greatest faith and find it lacking. That was his attitude towards the Jews. To the people in his own hometown, says he, marveled at their unbelief. The centurion was a man with so great a faith, he caused Jesus to marvel at it. So as we conclude, do we have the Lord's approval? Would we cause Jesus to marvel at us? Jesus told the Roman centurion he had yet to find greater faith in all of them. Israel was supposed to be his nation, his people, and yet he found them lacking. If Jesus were to walk in on us today, 1 Peter 2, 9-10, we're going to read that in just a second, tells us we are his people. Would he find us lacking? Or would he find us people of so great a faith? Notice what it says in 1 Peter 2, 9-10 as we wrap up. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you were once not a people, but now you are the people of God. You would not receive mercy, but now you have received mercy. Peter is quoting from the Old Testament, applying to what once was to the Jews, now to Christians everywhere scattered abroad. Christians are the holy people of God. Would he marvel at our faith or would he find it lacking? And that's only a question you and I can individually answer before God. We need to self-examine our own hearts and know would Jesus marvel at our faith, the faith to move mountains, or would he marvel at the lack of it? If you're not a Christian tonight, you need to be. Acts 4.12, going back to verse 10, when Peter talks about Jesus of Nazareth, he says in Acts 4.12, there's no other name in which we can be saved. We need to repent and be baptized into that name. Rising from the water is a new creature. And if, you're not, and if you are a Christian with sin prevailing in your life, now's the time to repent of it, to recognize it, to correct it, and be renewed. If we can assist you in anything this evening, if you're subject to invitation in any way, come forward and let it be known now while we stand and while we sing.